Thank you for joining us on this snowy Michigan evening. My name is Marty Schickman. I'm director of the Eastern Michigan University Center for Jewish Studies. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture by Tamar Manasseh, an African-American Jewish mother repairing cracks in our communities. Before we begin, however, I'd like to share my appreciation for the wonderful individuals and organizations whose efforts help make this presentation possible. Among those I would like to thank tonight are the Center for Jewish Studies Board, the fantastic students at Hillel at EMU, the Jewish Federation of Greater Ann Arbor's JCRC, the Harold Grinspoon Foundation, Temple Beth Emeth, and the Beth Israel Congregation, and the EMU Martin Luther King Annual Celebration Committee. Tonight is our third annual Art and Mary Schumann Lecture, named for two of the dearest friends and supporters of Eastern Center for Jewish Studies. The CJS would never have come into existence, let alone now become a 10-year-old institution. And yes, this is our 10th anniversary without Art and Mary's many years of advice, assistance, and advocacy. Our speaker tonight, Tamar Manasseh, is an African-American Jewish mother of two teenagers. She is founder and director of Mothers and Men Against Senseless Killings, M-A-S-K, an organization fighting gun violence on the streets of Chicago since 2015. And she has been the subject of features by NBC News, the PBS NewsHour, the New York Times, The Forward, and a full-length documentary, They Ain't Ready For Me. She is a movie star. And you'll see why in a moment. She is also the first woman ordained to the rabbinate as Chicago's Beth Shalom B'nai Zakin Ethiopian Hebrew Congregation. Rabbi Capers Funi, a dear friend of the EMU Center for Jewish Studies, who I believe is in attendance tonight, has described her ordination as, and I quote, a watershed moment for the Israelite community. At the conclusion of my conversation with Rabbi Manasseh, she'll take questions from the audience. Please record your questions by using the question tab at the bottom of your screen. My assistant, Cole Nelson, will provide a selection of these to Rabbi Manasseh. It's the practice of the CJS that student questions be given priority, and I hope you can appreciate that. So now, it is my enormous pleasure to introduce you to Tamar Manasseh. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me, Martin. And happy oh. 10th anniversary, guys. Yeah, I, I am. You know, you're, you're just fabulous. And and uh, I can't thank you enough for being here with us tonight. Is oh, it snowing in Chicago honor. as well? Oh, it's everything in Chicago. It's snowing. It's two degrees. It's, it's, it's bare weather. It's, well, I wish you know, we would have made it that far. But I mean, it's, it's real football weather now. Well, you know, I mean, it, it's th there's a part of me that was this afternoon sort of thinking it's a good thing we we didn't do this face to face because it would have been brutal flying you in from from Chicago today. And I, and you know, I once I thought for a minute about driving, but even the highways getting back and forth would have been insane. So I mean, this yeah. is the best way to do it. Like, there's no traffic. It's great. This is wonderful. So thank you for coming, and and, uh, and let's talk a little bit. I have some questions for you, as you know, and uh, and and we'll talk about these, and I'm sure that the audience has a, a bunch as well. So let me begin with, with I guess, it's an obvious question. Uh, you, you've been noted for saying, and, and this is a quotation, I'm just a Jew, and I'm a Black woman in America. And I'd like to chat with you a bit about 
about that powerful assertion of identity. What does it mean to be a black Jewish woman? And, and what should it mean to your fellow Americans? How, how, how are we to think about that? Or how do you think we should think about that? Um, how do, how should you think about it? Maybe I should tackle that part first. Um, I don't necessarily think you should think about it. I think that me being a Jew is, it should just be something that is commonplace is so common that nobody is saying, oh, wow, she's black and she's Jewish. Nobody says, hey, you know what? I wonder if that guy, you know, I heard he's a Christian. No one cares about that. I just want it to be common. I just want it to be common. I don't want it to be, I don't want to be when when somebody, I have a conversation with someone, I don't want them to lead with, oh, you know, she's black and she's Jewish. Well, yeah, obviously I'm black, but we have to throw the Jewish part in there. Like how fascinating is that? Because it it's like this idea that people like me aren't supposed to be Jewish. If you look like this, you're clearly supposed to be Baptist, duh. Like you don't, you're not supposed to be Jewish. And I, I want that to go away. I want this to just be something that's not even, it's not even anything that re anybody, anyone really even pays attention to. It's just common. Um, and me being a Jew and a black woman in America, um, I found that lately there's this idea of people sometimes call me a Jew of color. I'm not a Jew of color, I'm black. I'm black and I'm Jewish. That's what I am. I'm black. And America has a very contentious relationship with black people. And if you can change the name to anything else, you can call me anything else that makes it, you know, easier to evade the responsibility that America has to black people or to, to easier to not confront the issues that black people have with America, then you just call us something else and it's not as hard. So I don't like being called of color. I am black. It is, it's very confrontational. It makes people confront the relationship between black people and white people in, in America. It makes people have to deal with that. But when you say I'm of color, then it's not so much. That can mean kind of anything, just not white. No, black is black. I mean, on my birth certificate, it says something different from on my daughter's birth certificate and on my mother's birth certificate. My, all three of us are different races. And nobody sat down and had a conversation with my mother and said, hey, do you want, you know, black on your on your kid's birth certificate? And nobody asked me, hey, do you want African-American on your kid's birth certificate? No, you just call us what you want to call us. And it makes it easier. But white never changes. It's just always white. But black is always an issue. It's always something. It's always this problem. We don't know what to do with this. It makes us uncomfortable. So, no. I don't let anybody off the hook by calling me of color. Slaves weren't of color, they were black. Those were black people. So no, no, you don't get to, you don't get to make this easier for you while it stays the same for me, not at all. So that is, that is why I am, I'm a black woman, but I'm also Jewish. And I think the part that people have to contend with more than anything about me is the black part. It's not the Jewish part, it's the black part that people struggle the most with and don't even know it. Well, that's fascinating to me. So you don't get any pushback on the Jewish part or you, you, you don't feel you get much pushback on that? Oh, not anymore. I don't really allow that. Like, I, I mean, I've been doing this my entire life, my whole life. I, I mean, I learned how to deal with this when I was seven years old and black people were telling me I couldn't be a Jew because the Jews killed Jesus and Jesus freed slaves. And how dare you say you're a Jew? And I mean, like, what? Like, Jesus did, the Jews did what to Jesus? What? Like, for a seven-year-old, that's a lot. But you had to learn to say, hey, were you there? Like you really, I had to really learn how to have these conversations with adults. Just like in my Jewish day school, I did have to learn the, to have conversations with white people about how I was Jewish because I was black. So I grew up actually having to make the argument with both of them, with both white Jews and with non-black, I mean, non-Jewish black people about who I was as a Jew. So I really learned, I had to fight for my Judaism. I had to fight for my identity. So now nobody gets to tell me what I am or what I'm not. I tell you what I am, if I feel like doing that. But you don't get to question me or challenge me about who I am. You don't get to do that. I just don't allow it. That's all. You, you're just fabulous. I just want you to know that. Thank you. Okay, so 
then not only are you a Jew and a black woman in America, but you also recently made history as the first woman ordained to the rabbinate at Chicago's Beth Shalom B'nai Zaken Ethiopian Hebrew congregation. Uh -huh. and, and my question is, okay, so you have done so much in your lifetime and you're to this old man, a very young woman. You have done so much in your lifetime. Why choose to break this barrier? And, and, and were there barriers placed in your way? Why, why study to become a rabbi of all things? Well, you know, the things that we do for our children, Marty is insane. <laughs> the things that we do for them, right? Um, I was in the pursuit of becoming a rabbi for 13 years. It took me twice as long and then some change as it would a man to get there. That's what happened. And um, it's, it's almost like in that 13 years, I started mask. I, 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 I finished all my courses and I, I became a rabbi in that time. And I started to do the job, but I didn't have a bima. I had no pulpit. I had no congregation. So where can I apply all of these things that I learned in my studies? Okay, well, there's stuff going on in the world and I have children. And so my kids at that time, my kids are now, they aren't teenagers. My daughter is 25 and my son is 23. Wow. But at the time I started masks, they were, they were both teenagers. And the thing about it was, um, I didn't want them to die. I didn't want to lose them. And I knew that violence is claiming the lives of black kids. It doesn't matter. No one cares that my son wears a kippah. No one cares that my daughter was a Chidon HaTanakh scholar. No one cares about that. Bullets don't, they are, they don't, they don't discriminate. They don't care. And I didn't want to lose them. So I had to do what I could because being a Jew and being Jewish is about action for me. It's not about, it's not about the talk. It's about the walk. It's about actually, what do you do? How do you Jew? I say that all the time. How do you do it? What does your Judaism actually look like? Because you can't just get up in the morning and be like every other American and say you're Jewish. That does not work because that's not who the Jewish people are. This is about work. There are these commandments. There are all these rules. It's stuff to do. You have to live it. And so it's kind of like, how do I understand? I have to understand gun violence, right? So how can I understand that sitting at home in my living room or sitting behind my desk at work? I have to be out there in it. I have to be, I have to be around it. I have to understand it. I have to see it. I have to hear it. I have to be a part of it to understand it. And it's crazy when I got to that corner um, where we started, all I could think of, uh, in a place where there are no men, be a man. There were no men there. And I had to be a man. I had to be present. I had to be um, everybody's mother. I had to be everybody's sister, everybody's aunt, everybody's cousin. I had to be whatever the young people in that neighborhood needed to understand what was going on. It was them that were gonna help me understand gun violence and why it was happening and how to get us out of it. So I had to be as open to them, open to them because I wanted them to be open to me. And it, it was, it was kind of like building a Mishkan on the corner. It's kind of like creating this place, this holy space, this tent that's open on all four sides. I'm gonna cook you dinner. I'm gonna go Abraham on you. That's what I'm gonna do. And in that time, I'm gonna learn everything there is to know about you. But at the same time, you're gonna to get to know me too. And you're gonna to get to know why I do the things that I do. And that's when so many of the people in, my, in that neighborhood, in my neighborhood, these are black people, got to know Judaism, got to know what Judaism was like, what we were motivated, what it motivates us to do, what it looks like, because they'd never seen it before. They see it on TV, they, um, might see it when they go downtown Chicago or something like that, but they don't see Jewish ideas and Jewish, Jewish values alive in their neighborhoods for them to be a part of. They don't see how Jewish values affects their lives. They never saw that until I was there. And if I was, if that became my bema, that became my pulpit, that became my congregation. Because I felt like, you know, I learned 
Jews have so many answers. We have all of these, you know, we, we have all these beautiful teachings and we have these partial every week and we learn all of these different lessons and Torah is like a, it's this prismatic thing and it's always something different every year you learn so much as much as you change, it changes. We have all of these answers, but we keep them in the synagogue. We keep them behind air rooms. We keep them to ourselves. And it's kind of like when you share those things with the world, those are gifts. Those are gifts that we've been given to share with the world. But many of us are too afraid to share it. We're too afraid. But when you let it out in the world and it just becomes free range, and you just let it loose on, on the world. It is a beautiful thing. And so for me, um, I, it chose me. It was just, it was one of those things. I was, this was bound. I was bound to become this. I was born for this. I was, I was created for this. And I told them um, during my sermon for um, when I was ordained, I said, you know, if I was a guy, I would have been here when I was 18 years old. They would have known that this is who I was supposed to be my whole life. And I would have been groomed for it. But since I was a girl, hey, you need to learn how to bake chicken. Well, I can't cook. So I better learn how to read some Torah. Like that's what needs to happen. But my daughter was so smart and my daughter, like I said, so talented. And um, she like me can't cook. And I just knew she seemed to really show an affinity for Torah and for Jewish studies and Jewish language and the Hebrew language. And um, I didn't see, I didn't see a road for her. I didn't see a path for her. What if she did want to become a rabbi? Well, there was no avenue for girls to become rabbis then in our community. So since, you know, if this is what my daughter may want to do one day, I have to make sure that she can do it. So if I have to do it first to pave the way for her and any other girls that are coming behind her, then okay, I'm going to do that. Why not? So that is how I got involved in it. So I'd like to chat with you just a little bit about your mission mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you're, you're, you're taking to the streets, literally taking mm -hmm. to the streets. Um, what happened? What did you do? And, and where have you gone with it? Well, there was a mom that was murdered in a drive-by um, seven years ago, Lucille Burns. And um, she was breaking up a fight, like on a summer night, 7.30, it's still light outside. And she's breaking up a fight between these two kids and somebody just drives by and shoots her. She's dead. What got me was on the news, they reported it as her being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now that didn't sit well with me because uh, you know, you see on the news where black men and black boys are being murdered. You see even where little black girls are being murdered, but now moms too. In, in the process of momming, in the course of momming as a verb, doing what mothers do, you're murdered and then they say you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. So if a mom is at the grocery store, a mom is picking her kids up from school, any of the other things that mothers do, if you're murdered then, doing your job as a mother, then you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. You shouldn't have been there. No, the people who did it, the people who shot her, the people who with the guns, they shouldn't have done it. They were in the wrong place doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. Turn this around. It's not on the victims. And so I figured that would interfere with the way that I parent to my kids. It's already hard enough. You learn how to parent from your parents. And it's no way that I could let my kids do half of the things when they were teenagers that my mother let me do. That my, ki my kids can't do the things now that I did when I was their age because it's just not the same world. It's not so safe. Chicago had 800 murders this year. And it's, I can't, I can't, I trust them, but I don't trust the streets. And it's kind of like when that happened, three days later, my friends and I were sitting on a corner opposite where she was murdered in hot pink t-shirts with a barbecue grill and lawn chairs. Because the idea was, I don't want, I, this is in a neighborhood watch. I'm not peeking through the blinds. I'm not, I'm not doing that. Um, I'm sitting on a corner and I want you to know that I see you. I see you. And if I can anticipate that this corner this block is going to be part of a cycle of violence. And I know that retaliation is coming here. Then, you know what? I'm going to sit here because I don't believe that these kids are just murderers, cold-blooded killers. I don't believe that. 
I want to believe that every mother, every grandmother, every aunt that had custody tried to teach their kids something. They did the best that they could, that there's still a soul within them, that they aren't dead inside. I want to believe that because I believe that about my own kids. And I just did not believe somebody would be, some kid would be brazen enough to come and shoot anybody with 10 mothers sitting on the corner barbecuing. I just did not believe that. I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. And so every day there would be, it became a movement. More and more moms would show up and more and more people would show up on this corner. And within a week we were cooking dinner for like 150 people on a street corner. And it became probably the safest corner in the city of Chicago. It went from being a hot spot to one of the safest places because there was so many people there. And it was so many people there for good, to do something good. And there was no retaliation. And I mean, it was years before somebody got shot again there. And when they did get shot, we weren't there. And it just created a different idea. The people in the neighborhood wanted something different. They saw that different was, was somehow, it was possible. And so they wanted more of the difference. So they became that, they became different to create different in their community. And so um, now we have um, six chapters around the, around the country and we're going to be adding more because community is needed everywhere. It wasn't just about stopping the violence. It was about building community. So now, um, like, uh, I am very proud that we have the best sukkah soiree in the entire city. Our sukkah on our corner is hands down the best one in the city of Chicago every year. It's awesome. And people love to come and like they're dancing like, you know, the horror and then they're doing the wobble is good stuff. And everybody is involved and it's a big celebration for the entire community. We do Passover together. We do Chris Mahana Kwanzaa. We do all of these things together because, I mean, this is what I know how to do. This is who I am. This is the way that I pour love on my people. And now uh are, are you i mean it's the middle of winter in chicago mm -hmm. uh what well, what are you doing out there now so we actually built a school there out of shipping containers when they when they closed down all the high schools in the neighborhood we actually built a school out of shipping containers and um so proud of it it's, it makes me so happy to talk about it but it reminded me, my father is from the South and he went to school in a one room schoolhouse. And I figured that so many of um, our best minds, so many, so many black people, so many black intellectuals and trailblazers, and they, they came out of one room schoolhouses in the South. That was at a time when, you know, they didn't teach us. White folks wouldn't teach us. So we taught ourselves and we did pretty good. And so now we're back in a place where if you won't teach us again, we'll do it again. If it worked for us the first time, why won't it work again? So I was inspired by the idea of what we were able to do then. Why can't we do it now? And I am a student of history. And it was so many great things that came out of those places. And I, I felt like, you know, what if we could give that? What if we could give that to these kids here? What if we could make education more accessible so they don't have to cross 10 different gang boundaries to get to a school that's failing and overcrowded in Chicago? They can just walk right to the corner. What if we could give them that? So that's what we created. And we had kids in our classroom during the entire pandemic. So when all the rest of the schools were closed, we were still, we were in a classroom the whole time. And um, now we're doing dinner. So when the kids get out of school and they do after school matter programs, then they come to us and they eat dinner. So that's what we do every night. So anybody want to donate for dinner? Go to the website, go to our Facebook page, sign up for Take Them a Meal. We really appreciate it. So yeah, that, that's what we're doing now. And we do have a study buddy tutoring thing um, online. So we, you know, we have a few things going on. And, and it's safer. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's safer. You know, people ask me sometimes like, hey, do you, do you like carry a gun? Absolutely not. Um, do you, um, I'll get, I'll put that website in. It's um, www.ontheblock.org. And it's uh, Mask Chicago on Facebook. But um, it's like, people say like, do you wear a bulletproof vest? Uh, no, it's like 120 degrees in Chicago in the summer. 
I don't think so. Like, no, that's not happening. But people feel like it's it's like being in my living room now when I'm there. It doesn't feel doesn't feel scary. So you you you've answered many of the questions I had written out for you, but I I, I still have a few, and and one or two that are, are maybe a little different, and I hope you'll indulge me. Um, you're you're involving yourself now. I mean, because now now you're 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 kind of a star. I mean, you know you've. You've had a documentary made about Try you. Try to it's tell like, my kids that. I'm no well, They'll tell you. No, you're not. But yeah, <laughs> I get what you're saying. Um, you're involving yourself in Chicago politics, which is a long history of, of just, it's a nasty town for politics. Corruption, corruption. And, and corruption. I'd like you to tell us a bit about, you know, your, your, your foray into Chicago politics and, and where you stand with it. I don't really want much to do with Chicago politics. I just want, I want Chicago safer. I want Chicago better. Um, that's what I want. And if, you know, I have to kind of dip and dabble in the politics of Chicago, then I will. And I mean, for me, I don't necessarily want to run for office. I mean, I did, but I only did that because, I mean, I had to do it so I would vote because I didn't have anybody else to vote for, so I had to vote for myself. But um, I'm trying to get people to be uh, more educated voters and more engaged in the process and actually see that they do have some power in the process. And um, I believe that not just Chicago, but all over the country, we need to change the way we do politics. I don't think that, you know, people should just run for a year before they want our votes or two months or three months. No, I think you should go the whole four years. Right now, I mean, people are afraid to drive on the expressways in Chicago because they might get shot. Um, people are, this pandemic is, I mean, people don't know what to do. You don't know whether to send your kids to school or not. People are scared to do that. Um, like, literally, I'm sitting in my living room in front of the window. I probably should be sitting here. But, I mean, murders happen everywhere. It happens to everybody in this city, 800 people. And it's kind of like, I need somebody in office who's just as afraid right now as I am. I need somebody in office right now who's going to be in office who's trying to figure out how to fix that just like I am. I need somebody out cooking dinners, hugging kids, picking kids up from school, dropping them off, tutoring, doing whatever they have to do to create a safer future. I need them out there. I need to see them doing that right now. I don't want to hear about how accomplished you are. I don't care how many degrees you have. I don't care about any of that. None of that matters to me. Can you stop the bleeding? First of all, do you even understand what's going on here? And so many people don't. They know how to talk the talk. They have a really good game. They studied us. They understand how people think. They know. This is, I mean, it's a business. It, politician, political strategist, it's a genius. And a strategy is understanding what people like me and you want to hear. We can't do that anymore. It's too dangerous. It's too dangerous. We're dying because of it. We need more people who are, I need to sh show your work. We need to see what you've done the whole time before you ask us for your vote. I need to see what you've done since the last person got in office. I need to see why you're a better option. So um, I'm going to be starting a campaign. The There's no such thing as campaign season anymore. Campaign season is four years if you want to be the mayor of Chicago. Yeah, that's, it has to be. We have to see what you're capable of. And we're going to be running some of our own kids from around the block for local offices like Alderman and stuff like that. We believe that they can do it. Who else is more impacted by bad politics than people on the ground, than young people in the hood? So we believe that our kids can do that. And you will see some of those names on the ballot. I think most of us, most Americans, are more than somewhat aware of the importance of, of the black church in changing this country. Do, do you see the black synagogue as, as capable of, of, of having an, a major impact? No, I don't see the black church doing that really anymore either. Uh -huh. I, think, I, I don't think any, I don't see any religion that's inside of the walls doing that anymore. I think it needs to come out. Now that I've seen what it can actually do outside the walls of the synagogue, the church and the mosque, that's where it's needed. The people who need what people get in churches and mosques and temples, 
the people who need it the most are the people who don't have the bus fare to get to any of those places. They're the people who don't even know, you know, those kind of places exist. You have to bring your message to the people. You have to go where the people are. You have to be in the midst of the people because those are the ones that need it. Some people don't have, they don't have the gas money. They don't have a car. They don't have the means to get to the synagogue. They don't have the means to get to the temple, or, I mean, to the, to the mosque or the church. They don't. It has to be something that's a bit more accessible and, and, and public and in the world. It has to be a part of the world that it wants to change. And I don't necessarily see it having an impact if it doesn't. I mean, the nearest synagogue to 75th and Stewart, the corner in Inglewood where we're set up, is, um, what, four or five miles away. And then when you get there, um, it's, it's pretty much, it's patrolled and surrounded and guarded by, by Chicago police. So who wants to go through that? It's just, it's frightening even going into a synagogue because of what you have to go through. And if you're Black, what are you even doing here? So it, it, it really deters people from, from coming into the synagogue. It, they, don't, they really don't want to do it. And it's, it's, it can be, we just have to be more approachable. We have to be more open. We have to be just, just more accessible, more on the spot. I don't see where the Black anything is going to have an impact on the Black community if it's not in the Black community. So my last question for you, which is a big one, before I turn you over to our audience. Do you think you can make Chicago and America better? What gives you pause? What, what, you know, what keeps you up at night? And, and finally, what gives you hope? Um, do I think I can make Chicago and America better? Um, I think if people would just receive the message of caring about each other to not be afraid to care about each other. Everybody, we're so fearful of one another. We are, we're so fearful. Um, everybody's not gonna kill you. You can't always believe what you see on TV. Everybody's not gonna kill you. And if you treat people like they're not human, they, they begin to act like they're not human. If you treat people like they're feral, that's how they begin to act. But when you start to recognize the humanity and other people and start to treat them like the human beings that they are, then it changes everything. But we're too afraid to, to even interact with each other. We're too afraid to go around each other. I have so many conversations with people like this in Illinois. And um, I had a conversation with a lady on the North Shore and the North Shore is pretty wealthy. And she says, you know, I really want to come down to your block. But, but, you know, I'm afraid, like, you know, if I come there, like, what do I do with my car? And I'm like, you put it in your purse, of course, like everybody else does, right? You park it. It's a car. It's a car. That's what you're afraid of. But the issue is, it's not, it's not, there's no data that supports your fear. Nobody is, you know, murdering and robbing and raping, you know, old blue hair bubbies coming down from the North Shore. That doesn't happen. Nothing happens. There's no data that supports people that look like you need to be afraid when you come to my neighborhood. None. So you're really just afraid of fear. That's your own hang up. You have to deal with what you have going on inside of you first. You have to confront your own biases because a lot of white Jews have cast their lot in with white Americans. And the issues that black people have with white Americans really honestly has nothing to do with white Jews with Jews who didn't get here until after the Holocaust. And they had nothing to do with it. But because you cast your lot in with them, now your fears are your their fears are your fears. Even though this has nothing to do with you at all. And so you're afraid people like that look like me don't live in your neighborhood, but black people on the South Side see white people all the time. All the police are white. Most of the teachers in the schools are white. You know, that's what we see all the time. So people aren't afraid of you coming down. They aren't angry that you're coming into our neighborhood. They aren't upset about that. They see white people all the time. You have an issue. You're afraid because you hardly ever see black people where you live. You don't see us at the gas station or at the supermarket. We're not your neighbors. None of that. You have to drive for 30 minutes before you get into the city where you see black people. So sometimes we have to confront the issues that we put on others. It's not my problem. You aren't afraid of me. The fear lives in you. 
you have to confront that first. You don't actually have a problem with me. You have a problem with yourself. So I think once we start to be more honest with ourselves and, and look closer at who we are, and we do start looking at other people like the human beings they are, I hope that's what people learn from me. I think that's the only way that I can improve Chicago or America. I can set that example. That's it. Otherwise, I mean, I'm not too optimistic right now about the direction that America is headed in. I mean, it keep, that's what keeps me up at night, the direction that America is headed in. It is, it's very scary. It's very scary. It's, we have um, issues at the top. We have a lot of issues at the top and it's, it's, it's making life hell for people, you know, in, in our cities, it's, it's scary. And what gives me hope? Can we come back to that? I mean, like, <laughs> I don't know what I'm hopeful about just yet. Like, you know, no, you know what I'm hopeful, what gives me hope? What gives me hope is um, I went to a Jewish day school a couple years ago. And um, when I walked in the door, there was a huge banner with my picture on it. And it said, Hineni, here am I. And I could not imagine, like, there is a picture of me hanging up in a Jewish day school. Now, when I was a kid in Jewish day school, I could not imagine that. Like, I couldn't imagine it. Like, I could not imagine a, a, another Jewish woman that looked like me. We learned about her, or there was a photo of her in our school or in our, in our classroom, anywhere. I could not imagine that. But these kids knew who I was. They knew the whole story. They knew everything. It was wonderful. And not one of them said, you know what? I didn't know Black people could be Jews. They know these are the kids that are going to change the world. I am those kids, those kind of kids, they give me hope. That's how the world changes. It changes because of kids like that. I, I can't even begin to tell you how fabulous I think you are. I just, you. Want, I just want to say that. I want to put that Thank on you. the table for you. Thank That's you. on the table. Uh, I'm not <laughs> going to turn it over to Cole, who has, I think, some. Cole, do you have some questions? Yes, indeed, I do. Well, we're going to have some questions from the audience for you. Well, again, thank you so much. That was really, really wonderful. I think it's uh, it was honest in a way that I think a lot of people need right now. It's it's very difficult for people to say we need to make big changes, but when big changes need to be made, I think it's so important to have people like you saying that and saying that loudly and over and over again. So, thank you again so much. That was really wonderful. Uh, our Thank first you. question is from Mary Schumann, and I think this is a <clears throat> this is a very big question. So answer it in any way you wish. But how do you think the Jewish community in America can kind of reconnect or connect for the first real time, depending on the way you view it, with the Black community in America? How can these two groups, who are kind of oppressed but in quite different ways, I, I would say, how can those two groups find solidarity? Mm. Yeah, I deal with this question all the time. Like, this is my life. So start with the short story. So when the tragedy happened in Pittsburgh, and um, I think the shooting took place actually during the Amida. That's where I was at in Chicago. I was at Temple was during the Amida. And um, when it happened, my phone started ringing. And you know, I'm not supposed to have my phone on in service, but I mean, I always do. I'm sorry, Rabbi. I mean, you know, you know what I do. You know how I am. Please forgive me. Young Kipper's coming back. I have to have something to atone for. So my phone is on. So I get up and I run out because my phone keeps ringing. And it is it's different people from around my block calling me. And somebody says, are you OK? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Why would I be OK? And he's like, you know, like they're shooting up synagogues right now. And I'm like, what? what? Shooting at synagogues? And it wasn't all of the synagogues. It was just that one. But this kid thought about, wait, you're at Temple. Are you all right? And once you found out I was all right, the second question was, what about our friends? What about the other Jews on the north side? Are they OK? Are they OK? Do they need us? Is it anything we can do to help? Now, these are young people from the South Side that are saying this, that aren't Jewish, 
but they are aware that there's something going on with Jews right now and it's not good. And how can they help? Because they have formed these actual real relationships with these people because they see them all the time. They come down to the block, they bring their kids, they bring their dogs, we barbecue, we get Manny Petties, we do karaoke, you know, we talk about how to trick our three-year-olds into eating green vegetables. We do all of this stuff together, right? And when something like that happens, it didn't just happen to us, it happened, it, it happened to the whole community. And that was the community that we built on that corner. So with that, I understood we are capable of building these very real bridges and not just like, you know, like, uh, Dr. King and Rabbi, um, why can't I think of, I hate when I, I'm sorry, I blanked. Me too. Tell me I'm Marty. Hesho. No, I, I, I'm, I'm Rabbi Heshu and Dr. King. Sorry, Rabbi Heshu, so sorry, so sorry. Rabbi Heshu and Dr. King. That was like 50 years ago, right? So I wasn't born. So you mean to tell me Rabbi Heshu and Dr. King was the last like, you know, friendship, notable friendship between a black person and a Jew, we gotta do better than that, right? That can't just be the only example of the time when a black Jew or would a Jew of any color work with someone that was black and that wasn't Jewish. It has to be all of these different kinds of combinations, right? It has to be all of these different crossovers. 50 years we haven't seen that. That's still what we bring up every MLK day. That's what we talk about as Jews, Dr. Heshu and Dr. Rabbi Heshu and Dr. King. Come on, we gotta do better. Like there has to be like, you know, some sort of other combos that we're, out there, we're looking at or we're working on, some other relationships that we're building. And I see that when we create spaces where it's not my church, it's not my temple, it's not my mosque, it's not my house, this is just a neutral space where we get together and we're equals in this space. And we do whatever we want to do in this space. And for us on the corner, it's it's cooking dinner and listening to music and just hanging out and having fun. However, you can build a relationship, a human, just two human beings, two people, not a Jew and a Christian. Judaism has nothing to do with that. Let's just be human beings right now. Christianity has nothing to do with this. Some people are unlisted and they aren't into any of it. Fine. We're just building relationships. That's it. And once we get to a point where we can actually start, you know, we can start asking each other hard questions and talking about things with each other that we might not talk about with other people because we feel comfortable enough, then we can maybe introduce the the conversation about our religious preferences or understandings into it. But that's not where we start at. We don't start there. We start with just our humanity, with us just being human beings. And we start in these spaces. We start in a vacant lot on a corner in Inglewood. So literally, you can start this anywhere. And whenever we go, like when I go to other places and other cities to start other chapters, the first people I look for is the synagogues. What synagogues are here? Is there a JCC? Who do I need to talk to so I can start trying to build these real relationships between the black community and the Jewish community? Because they are important. I think so that's such a, it is, a good way to put it because it makes it one-on-one. -on -one. It's not that yeah. one person has to fix everything. It's that yeah. you just need to talk to someone. You need to establish yeah. that connection. And yeah. anybody can do that. You know, yeah, people, everybody mm -hmm. can go out and talk to someone about these, you know, these issues. Not everyone yeah. can go out and fix things on their own. Nobody can. And I think that's yeah. a really, uh, a really important message to push at a time where it feels like everyone has to solve every problem all at once. Yeah. And the thing is, I don't need you to solve my problems. Like when you come down to the south side and you come into the block, I don't need you to come solve my problems. You're just here to hang out with me while I solve my problems. And I'll come and hang out with you while you solve yours. And I mean, maybe sometimes the chances can come, you know, there are situations that I can help you solve and some you can help me solve, but I'm not your savior, you're not mine either. We can do this together, but I don't need you to do this for me. I need you to do it with me. Just like you don't need me to do it for you, you need me to do it with you. I can help. I have just as much value as you do. I have things that I can offer too, just like you do. 
So, I mean, I think that is the most beautiful part of what I see when I see all of these different people down on the South side, when I see all of these people having these relationships and having these conversations and hanging out with each other when they're not on the block. And I see pictures and it's like, you know, people post pictures and they're together and they're on Facebook. And I'm like, ah, oh, wow, I wasn't invited. <laughs> like, it's beautiful though, right? Like, it's amazing. But I mean, I see all of these things. It's 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 really great. And I think sometimes um, I talk a lot about anti-Semitism and we have discussions like that about stuff like that. And, you know, because so many people are getting to really know who we are down there, you might have someone saying who's not Jewish at all. They might have a friend. I've read, I've seen this happen so many times on Facebook who'll say, um, somebody will make a comment and they'll say, well, no, that's not how Jews are. At least the Jews that I, I know aren't like that. And these are people who are advocating for the Jewish community who aren't even a part of it. But because they've gotten to know us, it's like, wait a minute. You know, they, they were in a bad rap before, but I know them now and that's not who they are. And we need more of that. We need to show more of who we really are in the world. It'll really move us forward. So I think in a, a similar kind of train of thought, but a bit more business-like in a sense, what were any allies, whether they be government, other, you know, uh, nonprofits, allies, collaborators, when you were creating Mask, when you were working on actually building up this program? Did you work uh, with any outside forces? No, not really. No, the alderman came to the block a couple of times and he got scared. And I was like, I promise I'm not going to let you get murdered. You can come back. You don't have to be scared. All right. And like that was literally seven years ago. And he never came back. It's just he never came back. Um, but no, you know, we had the police ask us like, you know, the first day, like, you know, have you heard anything? Have you seen this guy or have you? Well, I'm, I'm not here. I'm not here. I don't work for you. I don't work for you. This is about community police policing. That's what this is about. And that means that sometimes the community has to police the police. We weren't friends anymore after that. The police don't like being policed. They don't. And so it, there are so many things. When you're on a corner in the middle of a neighborhood like Inglewood and you're at a hot spot, you see everything out there. You see everything. You see everybody's good, bad, and indifferent. You see it all. So it's kind of like, you know who does what, and you understand why certain things happen. And so no, like they wanted us to go away. And it was a, a certain part, like a point where they tried to turn the young people in the neighborhood against us so we would leave. Wow. And that could have been really dangerous. But the thing was, it was kind of like, if you go hang out with them, we're going to lock you up. And they would lock them up. And as fast as they would go lock them up, I would go bond them out. So everybody understood this is about harassment. This is about divide and conquer. If I leave here, you die. And I don't want you to die. So I'm going to sit here and make sure I keep you alive. And I'm going to come get you out of jail if they lock you up for, for sitting with me while I do that. Yeah. Wow. Really uh, horrific to know that you had to fight against all of those different kind of forces at, at once with you know, nobody backing you, but all the more impressive to see where you are now and what you've been able to do over the course of the pandemic. Yeah, it uh, makes you stronger. Sometimes it's just a shame to see, you know, and I think this is, we've talked about this in many other lectures like this, you know, is that something that's so commonly said about the Jewish community though? You know, you go through hardship mm -hmm. and it makes you stronger. The, the Jewish people go through hardship and it makes you stronger. You know, how do you keep pushing through when it feels like all you're given is hardship? How do you keep, what makes you keep going? Is it just because, the feeling that there's nobody else? No, because I keep getting stronger. Because I, I see it. I see the progress. We go to fewer funerals. We go to more graduations. Stuff like that. And the thing is, I can't stop. Then if I stop, people die. They die anyway in this city, but less of them die because I do what I do, because we do what we do. And I, yeah, I'm, I can't, I can't stop. This is not, this is my calling. I'm fairly certain that this is what I was born to do. You know, you can't really just tell God, like, you know what? I quit. 
I quit. And, you know, I've told people before, like, you know, I'm done with this. Like, I can't do it anymore. And then I realized I don't even know how to quit. I didn't, I don't know how to quit because it's not, it's not something that I created. It is, I mean, if I quit, what do I like change my phone number? Do I move? Like, you know, how do I stop doing this? How do I detach from this? I can't. It's Part not it. a job. It's a way of life. This is my life. This is who I am. You know, I haven't been on vacation in forever. I don't even know what a vacation looks like anymore. Do you know what I do when I go places when I'm supposed to be on vacation? I ask the people at the front desk at the hotel, where are the projects? Where is the absolute most violent area of the city? Point me in that direction. I want to go there. I want to see it. I want to see what's going on there. I want to understand it. And you know what? I end up starting another chapter of mass there. Boom, I'm at work. I have a vacation, I'm at work. That's what happens. Because I feel like, you know, people in these places need help too. 75th and Stewart is not just in Chicago. It's 75th and Stewart's all over this country. It's neighborhoods like that all over this country. Somebody gotta help. And if the people in their city aren't helping, then I'm gonna go do it. If I can do it, I'll do it because I can do it, because it's in me to do it, because I know how to do it. So I can't just say, you know what, I'm not paying attention to that because I'm on vacay. I can't, I don't get to do that. I think this is uh, one more really great question. Are there any specific Jewish ideals, values, earlier you mentioned, you know, commandments, the various numerous rules or scripture that you felt like you connected to your community who wasn't Jewish? Any beliefs, any Jewish kind of culture that you found already existing before you even kind of got there, if that makes sense? Um, Things that you shared without knowing I think it's it, a, a lot way. of Jewish culture that exists in the Black community because, I mean, the Black community relates our struggles so much to the Old Testament. So there's a lot of that. When we did a Seder, our first Seder in the streets that we did on the block, um, I have a friend who's actually British and I asked him to come and help me with the Seder. And so he says, so we're, we're divvying up parts, like I'm gonna do this, you're gonna do that. And so he says, you should tell the black story of the Exodus and I'll tell the Jewish story. Well, you are aware that those are the same story, right? Like, I mean, so you do know these are the same stories, just FYI. So how about I just tell both of them at one time? Let me do that, right? It is not that far of a stretch. I mean, when you're having a holiday, like um, you're talking to Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur is crazy on the block. Jews have Yiskor services. We have Yiskor. That is a powerful tool in a place that experiences as much loss as the South Side of Chicago does. It is a powerful tool. You are actually allowing people who have buried their 14 year olds, who have buried their eight year olds, who have buried their mothers, who have buried their, I mean, really, you're allowing them to still connect with those souls. They aren't totally separated from them. That idea blows their minds. It's not so final as I buried you and you're gone and that's it and now I start to get over it. It's not like that. It's, it's deeper. Every year you're lighting these candles, you're doing this thing, you're remembering them in a way that they've never heard of people being remembered. When you talk about Teshuvah and returning and you talk about redemption and the book is open and now you talk to God because the book is open and this is when you really you lay it all out there. You apologize for everything, you confess it, you ask for forgiveness, you do that. That changes the lives of people who just got out of jail for shooting, for felony gun possession, because you shot three people. And you just got out of jail and you believe you were beyond redemption. But nobody knows why you did that. What, what caused that? What cycle of retaliation were you in? Was it self-defense? You don't know. And we condemn people without knowing the whole story. But on Yom Kippur, that's between them and God. We give them a very special conversation that they never thought that they could have. And honestly, they never thought that they deserved. They thought that they were beyond redemption. So if you don't believe that you're, you are somehow 
um, capable. You are worthy of being redeemed, that you can't have that. You might continue to be a killer forever. You might, you might start killing, you might start doing all sorts of stuff because you felt like you went too far and you couldn't come back. But what if I told you you can? You can stop now, you can change everything, you can be a completely different person tomorrow. You don't have to wait to die to be, you know, to no, you don't have to do that. You get to start over every year. It changes who people are. And sometimes I think it might not be as violent as it was because people were given that opportunity. When you introduce these ideas, it changes who people are. It changes the way they see themselves. The idea of, you know, we were slaves in Egypt and um, we came out, but what would, what would we be now if we were free, but we never left Egypt? We would be Egyptians. We wouldn't be Jews. We wouldn't exist. We would just be Egyptians. And where would we be at on the social ladder of Egypt? We would be where Black people are right now in America. So just the ideas that we get to, I mean, you ask people to consider because you're Jewish and because they're learning so much about it and it applies so much to their lives and their world. It's like, how come I never knew this before? Why didn't anybody ever tell me any of this before? Yeah, it is. It's an amazing thing. I hope that answered the question, did it? No, I think it did. I, I think you okay. answered okay. It, it wonderfully. Uh, okay. If I can just have, I think, probably one more question just on the time we're running out, but this will probably be uh, a lengthy one because I'll let you answer it uh, in however long term you'd like. What's next? Whether that's for you, whether that's for Mask, whether that's for what you were talking with me and Marty a, a little bit about beforehand, what's mm -hmm. next for Chicago? What's next for that city during these times? So you're totally free to answer that however you'd like, but I'd love to hear what you have planned and what you see for the future. Just like, you know, when I get out of quarantine and I can go back out into the world, like world conquest and domination, that's pretty much what I'm gonna do. No, I'm just joking. But um, no, I just see much of the same, much of the same and um, creating other avenues where I can kind of, you know, we can get the message out. We can talk to more people. We can reach more people. Stuff like that is in the works. So that's that's kind of where I see it. It's, it's not that hard. It's pretty simple. It's just um, doing as much of this as I can in as many places as I can do it in for as many people to see. It's not about me telling you what I'm going to do. It's about me showing you what I'm going to do. It's about me teaching you how to do what I'm doing so you can make the changes in your community or in your life that I've made in mind. That's what it's about for me. So now see, well, that was simple. Thank you so much. This was really wonderful. Uh, thank you for all of your lovely answers to the questions. I'm going to pass it back over to Marty now. Uh, but thank you. That thank was you, amazing. Cole. A round of applause, truly. Thanks, A virtual Cole. round of applause. So I, it, it's hard for me to express myself. Um, when, when one of our uh, viewers, I think, expresses it so much better. And this is from Deja Richardson, who, who I don't believe I know, but it, it's, Deja writes, you are truly amazing. And by the way, I know she's not talking about me. <laughs> you are truly amazing. Such an inspiration to life and your community. Your motive and drive give so many people a reason to wake up Oh, and want to be a better person and not just to talk but to act on making a change this is my first time hearing about you it's truly an honor to meet you thank you and hear more people talk about making the world a better place and you. you know i think i think deja's kind of nailed it here um it, it was it, it, it's such a pleasure meeting you and talking to you and being in your presence and um and I, I can't thank you enough for joining us at Eastern Michigan University. You're, you're really wonderful. Uh, Marty, for, all of our guests, for all of our guests who came tonight, thank you. Uh, to Marty, the best. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having thank me, you. Marty. Thanks, Cole. Thank you so much. For everyone else, um, we're going to be having a, uh, a, a showing of Muriel Rookheiser's 
Houdini in March. It, it is a play made by the Jewish poet and playwright Houdini. You will be getting information about it. We'll be doing it both live and, uh, and online, and we hope you can make it in March. Uh, we're going to be having a celebration of our 10th anniversary in May, so please stick with us for more information on that. Thank you all for coming out on this cold and wintry day. Uh, we love you all. Uh, take good care. Be safe. Bye-bye.